that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. You ended up with this kind of technocracy, which presents itself as anti-politics, but which is actually politics that is in the interest of the status quo. I think increasingly people are inclined on every side of the political debate to imagine that they speak for the people, that they have a monopoly on legitimacy. Well, welcome everybody. Oh, as all these debates are, this is a very uh, topical issue, stories to believe in and the question of ideas and ideologies and politics. I think in the first half of the 20th century, obviously that was a time of grand political ideas, didn't entirely end well. But the later years seem to move towards a more managerial approach, a pragmatic political culture of effective management. Now, though, it seems that idealism is coming back, though it's taking a variety of different forms from tribal nationalism to radical socialism or environmental activism. Whichever it is, the goals and ideals in politics do seem to be back center stage. So how should we think about this? Should we reject this return to idealism as a vehicle for dangerous fantasies and a warning sign of future turmoil, of conflict, human misery? Or is idealism central and necessary to politics? And the shift back to idealism, perhaps a sign of hope, a necessary antidote to bland politics that only really serve the ruling elite. Well, I'm joined by an extremely distinguished panel and with long experience in these issues. Grace Blakely is an author who writes about economic policy and has actively campaigned for a Corbyn-led Labour Party. Her new book, The Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will Change Capitalism, explores the coming economic fallout from the coronavirus. The celebrated Michael Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard University and has been described by Newsweek as a rock star moralist. His legendary course, Justice, was the first Harvard course to be made freely available online and has been reviewed by tens of millions of people. His new book is The Tyranny of Merit, What Became of the Common Good. Rory Stewart, a former diplomat, former MP, author and politician, who catapulted himself into the UK political limelight uh, when he became one of the uh, country's more unusual and recognisable politicians capturing the attention with his centre ground campaign for conservative leadership. So we are going to ask each of our panellists to address their attention uh, in the first instance to the question that I, um, that I posed as to whether we should uh, reject the return to idealism as a vehicle for dangerous fantasies. Michael, would you start us off, please? Well, thanks so much, Isabel. I think it's certainly true that on the face of it, public discourse uh, has uh, seemed to be about narrow managerial technocratic things. Um, and this inspires no one. And when passion does enter, it comes in the form of shouting matches, where people shout past one another without really listening. I think this is made for an empty, hollow, unsatisfying public discourse. Citizens want politics to be about big things, including questions of values. And I think the discontent that's afflicted politics in democratic societies in recent decades has been a frustration with this empty public discourse. I'm not sure, though, that this empty public discourse doesn't conceal a certain kind of, well, you could call it idealism or set of political ideas that are implicit, that govern politics beneath the surface without open public debate. And those ideas, I think, are flawed. I would identify two. One of them is a certain kind of market faith, even a market triumphalist faith, the, the, the conviction that market mechanisms are the primary instruments 
for achieving the public good. That's been an idea hovering just beneath the surface of our seemingly technocratic managerial politics of recent decades. And there's a second, which concerns me a lot and which was the subject of my new book, The Tyranny of Merit. It's the idea that those who land on top, the winners of the global economy, uh, the, the idea that they deserve their success, that they've done it on their own, that their success is the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserve the bounty that a market society heaps upon them, and by implication that those who struggle, those who've left, been left behind, must deserve their fate as well. This is the dark side of meritocracy that I write about in the book. So I think it's a mistake to assume that a seemingly technocratic politics, the one that has predominated in recent decades, um, doesn't conceal um, a, a, a certain kind of moral dispensation, a kind of attitude and ideology even toward politics. And I think only now we're beginning to surface it, to confront it, and to debate it openly, as we should. Michael, thank you very much. So it may have looked managerial, Grace, but there was an ideology concealed just below the surface. Um, I, I, just to return to the, to the initial question, uh, is this a return, this overt return to idealism, something that we should reject? It was pretty dangerous last time around. I think the way that Michael just addressed that point to suggest that what appeared to be a kind of technocratic or managerial politics was actually politics in the interest of a certain group cuts to the heart of the, the point that, that I would like to make, which is that you can't really have idealism without some understanding of, of materialism. Um, and the, I think that is really what has left our politics over the last 40 years, and it was much more present prior to that. And so kind of what is materialism? Well, if you contrast idealism and materialism, they're two ways of looking at history. One suggests that history is driven forward by ideas, by debate, by people kind of, you know, changing their minds about things and therefore institutions changing. The other one suggests that history is driven forward by kind of, uh, by, you know, technological change, by economic change, by basically things that happen um, to the structures that kind of, uh, that, you know, predominate in our lives and that that's why institutional change happens. Now, on the second view, which is not particularly dominant, we live in a very kind of idealist society uh, in that sense. We kind of very much center ideas in our political discourse. We don't think so much about class anymore. And indeed, it's become very unfashionable to think about class in recent years. Um, because a, a kind of central theme of, uh, of that kind of materialist reading of history is that, uh, particularly when you look at it from a Marxist perspective, history is driven forward by conflict between different classes. And the politics is about overt conflict between those two classes over resources. Um, and the story of, the, I suppose, the kind of pre-financial crisis period is one where we were denying the existence of those class interests and therefore ended up with a technocratic managerial kind of politics, which was, which presented itself as uh, a way that we would be able to discover the common good. It was all about, I'm not ideological, I only care about what works. That was the view that was presented to the vast majority of people by our politicians. And yet, most of the time, because of the ideologies, because of the narratives, because of the, um, the, you know, the, the nature of the work that these people were drawing on, because of the nature of the interests that uh, were aligned behind them, the things that worked often ended up being the things that actually happened to be in the interests of, uh, of the ruling classes. So you ended up with this kind of technocracy, which presents itself as anti-politics, but which is actually politics that is in the interest of the status quo, that serves to reinforce and support the interests of the groups who are already kind of, you know, in charge uh, and most powerful uh, in our society. And I think that's really what we've seen a backlash against in recent years. It's the realization that what was presented to people, you know, we got the end of history moment, ideological politics is dead. Instead, you will hand over power to a set of politicians who uh, will, you know, Look, seek out the vote of the median voter, you know, the average person in society, and they will thereby put forward policies that are of the most benefit to the maximum number of people. That was the view, that was what we all put into. And then we realized in during the financial crisis and in the period since then, that the policies that we were told were based on, you know, uh, the, uh, consideration of the common good were actually 
more based on uh, an attempt to kind of promote the interests of some people over others, even if actually promoting those interests, I mean, you can think about the way in which the financial sector was consistently deregulated, actively harmed the interests of the majority. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.